Sounds Good is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it is the easiest way to make a podcast. When we were first getting started, getting ready to launch Sounds Good in 2015, making a podcast was hard. But now, thanks to Anchor, making a podcast is not only easy, it is fun. Anchor's creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and basically everywhere else. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Plus, now you can add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. Even if you're an OG podcast like ours, you can record and produce your show like you always have, but use Anchor as your host. You'll save money, have a superior hosting experience, and get advanced analytics. Anchor has everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. When we imagine a world with peace, oftentimes our default image is just a world with no violence or war. Peace defined by a lack of badness. And those are certainly huge parts of peace, but it's not the whole picture. And we can strive for more. And in this episode, we dive into what that could look like. This is Sounds Good. I'm Brandon Harvey. An organization called the Institute for Economics and Peace has developed a concept called positive peace, which describes a world that not only lacks violence, but also gains attitudes, structures, and institutions that build on and sustain peace. Things like well-functioning government, equitable distribution of resources, free flow of information, and more. Using data, the Institute measures levels of peace around the world and provides a roadmap for building lasting peace. At Good Good Good, we've quoted their data a lot. We've shared it in good newspapers and in good newsletters. We are huge fans of the work that these folks do. Today's guest is Steve Killalay, the founder and executive chairman of the Institute of Economics and Peace. His background includes decades of work in philanthropy, technology, and sustainable development, and he founded the Institute in 2007 as a nonprofit global research institute. Their research informs influential institutions like the United Nations and the World Bank. This innovative concept of positive peace can better inform our understanding of how to improve the world. And Steve is the perfect person to learn from. And I'm so excited to dive in. Let's get to it. Maybe we should kind of get started with a a brief biography of you because you've lived a unique life. You've lived almost a few lives. In a few sentences, how would you describe uh, who you are, where you come from, and what you do? If I look at my background, I come out of a middle-class Australian family born in Sydney. My father was an engineer. Uh, uh, I left school fairly early. I actually left school at 16. Sort of went off and spent uh, many years surfing in uh, various parts of Australia and up through Indonesia. Then got into computing about 25 uh, and studied computing. And then from there went on and de- ended up developing two computer programs uh, uh, from which I was able to develop two publicly listed companies. So the first one was on NASDAQ. And the second one was on the Australian Stock Exchange. So I made quite a bit of money out of all of that. <laughs> and so I set up a family foundation to work with the poorest of the poor. And so it did, to do interventions, which were substantially life changing. So that took, I spent a lot of time in Africa, a North, Northeast Asia, like Burma, Laos, Cambodia, uh, uh, and up around there. And Who came first, Steve Killalay or Bill Gates? Uh, I did. <laughs> I did, actually. <laughs> there we go. All right. <laughs> uh, I think I did. It's, it was all around the same time somewhere, yeah. So we, we, well, certainly when I started off in computing, the, uh, yeah, how can I put it, the cheap computer was $5 million. Yeah, so yeah, <laughs> very, very, so you didn't have them on your desk. 
So I started to work with the poorest of the poor. And so the family foundation I set up has done oh, something like about 200 different uh, uh, projects now in the developing world. So working with the poorest of the poor, I spent a lot of time in conflict zones or near post-conflict zones. And actually, what took me into the work I'm doing now, and we're here to discuss the peace work, and particularly the book Peace in the Age of Chaos, so I was in northeast Kivu looking at a project there dealing with fistula tears, and I was starting to think, what is the opposite of all these stressed out countries I'm spending time in? What are the most peaceful countries in the world? So I did some searching on the internet, couldn't find a thing, and that's how the Global Peace Index was born, which today is the world's leading measure of global peacefulness. But that, for me, posed a very, very simple question, because if a simple businessman like myself can be walking through Africa and wonder what are the most peaceful nations in the world and it hasn't been done, then how much do we actually know about peace? If you can't measure something, like, let's say, peace, can you really understand it? And how do you know whether your intervention is actually helping you or hindering you in achieving your goals? You actually don't. So it sounds like up until you created the Global Peace Index, there wasn't a measurement or a data point around peace, but there definitely was a a, a perception of what peace is defined as. And I'm curious, how would you describe how people have considered peace through the ages? But then also, how how do you now consider peace? How do you define it? Yeah, well, peace is it has is different depending on the perspective you're coming from. So if you look at you're in a war and the end of the peace at the end of the Second World War, so the peace is just the absence of a conflict. If you're looking at it and let's say you move into, let's say, spirituality or religious beliefs, like a, yeah, peace is a internally based and it's just a, a lack of afflic- an absence of afflicted of emotion, if you like. So that's another form of peace. So what I've realised after looking at all these different forms of peace is that peace is very much situational. It's very much depending on your intent and what you want to, what you want to do with the outcome. So from where we come from within the Institute for Economics and Peace, we have two types of peace we focus on. And the first is called the absence of violence or fear of violence. And that is pretty good because that can be measured. Uh, and so that's what, the, let's say, the Global Peace Index is structured around. And that's good because once you've got a ranking of the nations of the world by the peaceful, you know, now you can start to analyse it. But The thing with that type of peace, the absence of violence or fear of violence, it's called negative peace. And that's great for creating a measure of who's peaceful and who's not, but it doesn't really tell you anything about how you actually create peace. So the second definition of peace we work with is called positive peace, and that's the attitudes, institutions and structures which create and sustain peaceful states. And so that as a measure of what you have to do to create peace, a peaceful society. But the interesting thing is we started to delve more and more into positive peace. We found it was associated with so many other things we think are important. So if you think about it, so countries which are high in positive peace also have very strong resilience. They're also countries which, much, which are much more adaptable. You also find that countries which are high in positive peace have higher per capita GDP growth, like over the long period, something like 2% per annum higher than the con- than countries which are very low in it. You'll find that they perform better on measures of the ecological resilience, for example, better on measures of well-being, happiness, better on measures of inclusion. So although we started with looking at peace, to be able to arrive at this uh, concept of positive peace, what creates peaceful societies, we found the same architecture created so many other things which we think are important. So in many ways, uh, yeah, it describes an optimum environment for human potential to flourish. I was reminded while you were talking that in your book you quoted, when you were kind of introducing this idea of positive versus negative peace, you, you quoted Martin Luther King Jr. when he said that true peace is not merely the absence of tension, but it's the presence of justice. And it's interesting, this this model that you've taken for what positive peace is, because it seems to say it isn't about the conflict, that conflict is going to come at some point, whether it's 
a global pandemic or a terrorist attack or some sort of food insecurity. Something's going to happen. But if you have this groundwork of justice or this groundwork of various safety nets that you've kind of taken a measure, that is going to be- speak to our ability to weather these storms. Is is that a fair representation of of this concept that it's more about the systems that underlay everything. Look, I think that's a really good comment, Brandon. Uh, So if we're looking at peace, I I guess it's a relative concept. There's nowhere which is absolutely peaceful and there's nowhere which is just absolutely violent. So peace is a relative concept and it's only what you compare it to. So if we're looking at, let's say, Iceland's the most peaceful country in the world, for example, but it's still got uh, homicides and it's still got violent crime. And you still uh, you have the economic shocks like they got with the uh, global financial crisis when the company went bankrupt. But as you say, what's important is how systems respond to shocks. And so if we look at Iceland, for example, because it's an excellent case, it had one of the fastest economic recoveries in history. It was even, so it needed to be bailed out by the IMF. But it, after five years, it was repaying a, the money to the IMF. And when you look about it, the what happened is you had the, a whole lot of demonstrations on the street, particularly outside parliament. A new political party was formed. That political party then the next election came into power and then introduced it a whole range of uh, popular reforms. And that's an example of a system being able to adapt. So what's quite often when we're looking looking at uh, your history, if you like, and the US is no different, uh, we look at events and we see events as being really important. And then when we look at an event, we then look back and try and find the cause of the event and change the causes so those events don't happen or become more likely to happen in the future if we think it's a positive event. But we look at it, that's not really the way societies function because the cause and effect really lies, I guess, with, the, with physics and with empirical philosophy. So systems don't operate that way because with cause and effect, you always expect the same cause to have the same effect and that's what makes it repeatable and study and can be studied but in systems you, your effect is likely to come back and influence the cause think of two political parties always posturing the same response will be reacted to differently each time you go through the iteration loop if you like and so you'll find this all through society so you get an outbreak let's say of a pandemic societies respond so the next time you have an outbreak of pandemic it'll be very very different and so you can't expect things always to happen the same so we went back and let's say looked at let's say president trump and the election of president trump in the u.s if we look at that there's a whole series of events happening in the background which caused it to come about. He's just getting elected was an event. And that came back to a lot of dissatisfaction with the political system in the US uh, from on both sides of politics. And if we look back more deeply into the US, we can see over the decade leading up to, a, 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 let's say, Trump's election, the US had one of the biggest deteriorations in positive peace in the world. And that came around to things like perceptions of corruption. You remember the uh, comments like drain the swamp? Mm. Uh, you come back to uh, things like uh, concepts of fractionalised elites. That's where the elites within a society start to fight more and more and can find less common ground. You just equitable distribution of resources have been dropping and many a number of other things as well. And so we can see all this, these background conditions which have actually brought around the uh, election of a maverick or a rebel, if you like, because he really didn't come out of the uh, Republican Party and you get the flow on effects. But we tend to look at the effect, not the causes. This is so fascinating because I have heard this idea that, you know, Donald Trump is a symptom. He's not the cause. And I think that's a helpful thing because I personally love looking at deeper systems because that's how you actually create change. What I'm hearing from you is that not only are there systems that are problematic, you know, from 
the last 10 years, but but perhaps some of the systems that are broken are decades old. And so how do you even go about starting to create this deeper systemic change to create a better future? And how fast can you do it? In this global peace index that you've created, the United States is not at the top. It is not very close to the top. Do, do you remember off the top of your head what number we are? Oh, you're somewhere in the 120s from memory. Might be 128. Uh, I, I just pulled it up. It's uh, We're 121 out of... Uh, you've got 163 countries on the list. So we're not doing great. <laughs> yeah, no, well, yeah, you're not, but it's uh, not in the bottom quartile either. Uh, it's not great, but you have to understand there's a number of factors which come into it. Let's say, we'll just look at the US. So you come into it, you've got the largest uh, uh, military in the world. Uh, you've got uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, you've historically been involved in a lot of the uh, battles and a lot of wars, and you have a, a high number of a, 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 a people killed in these wars compared to other nations around the world. You also, uh, if we look at it, you've got one of the, high, the highest in prison rates in the world. In fact, you've got more people incarcerated than anywhere else. Uh, uh, homicide rates by Western standards are very, very high as well, and you've got a very, very large number of the uh, arms which are available uh, uh, within the country as well. So these, all these factors come together uh, to create its current ranking. So it's, it's, not, it's not just one thing. The, it's a whole range of things across the US. And so with all these deep systems in play here that have been affecting the US and its you know, peace rating on the index for years, how do we start to change this? How do we create a more peaceful country? And, and ultimately, how do we create a more peaceful world? Well, the book I wrote, Peace in the Age of Chaos, that sort of sets that out, along with a whole lot of uh, various uh, uh, stories around uh, from experiences in the developing world, which are sort of related to the subject matter. So for me personally, that's the first thing, uh, is sort of writing the book and trying to publicise, and that's why I'm here on the show, Brandon. But now if we look Look at it further than that. If we look, there's coming out of the positive piece, you can create an architecture for change. And it consists of eight different pillars, if you like. And none of these are, I guess, counterintuitive, but to, they all come together as a system, which we've already touched on. And so addressing a problem by just hitting one cause quite often leaves you open to unpredictable results. Mm. Whereas if you can look at a system and you can now produce multiple different interactions uh, aimed through different lenses of the system, you're more likely to get a response moving in a particular direction. And sort of systems are self-reinforcing. So if you, one of the great ways of thinking about human societies is to think about the human being because in many ways societies are an extension of human beings. So if we look at human beings, once you're actually moving well, you've got a good diet, good exercise, a uh, 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 healthy mental disposition, it's self-reinforcing. Whereas on the other hand, if you've got disease, for example, it's sort of deliberating and just pulls you apart. And we refer to these virtuous or vicious cycles and you can see them within societies. So if you come back to this architecture of positive peace with its eight pillars, the idea is to look, analyse the countries because all systems, in this case countries, are different. They'll have their own different unique flavours and things about them. So you don't really need to look at the system and then work out what you need to do. But these eight pillars you look at, you look at well-functioning government. So what are the areas which are working well, not working well, how can you improve it? Strong business environment equitable distribution of resources. That doesn't mean equal, but it means more, if you like, the social contract. Uh, equitable distribution of resources, high levels of human capital, uh, free flow of information. That's epitomised by uh, free press, like me being here, for example. Uh, uh, good relationships with neighbours. That's be neighbouring countries or in uh, many parts of the world, like Africa, neighbouring tribes or ethnicities and also acceptance of the rights of others. And these all come together to create a system. And now, if you think about 
a system. And like, again, just come back and think about your body. You can't radically change your diet overnight without running a risk, but you can change it over time. And so societies, if we come in and quite often when you're looking through a cause and effects lens, you'll see a cause and now you make radical changes to try and get rid of the cause and that can upset the system. So the idea is to do many interventions from many different angles, uh, to not big in nature, but they all have the progress of moving the system in terms of the right direction. But that's fine to say, and obviously at the end of the Second World War, uh, all these things naturally happened and our systems progressed very, very well, probably up to maybe uh, 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 the 80s, maybe further into the 90s before they started to decay, which is what we're seeing now. So, But the big thing is for people to realise that, that there's a need to change, and this is particularly true for, the, let's say, the elites and particularly true for policymakers. So the first thing is they do realise that things have to change and they do need to uh, do something different. And hopefully that might be the silver lining coming out of the COVID. Era. I was about to get into <laughs> where can we find some silver lining, but I, I first want to point out that I would imagine that listeners, just like my experience just now, when you were just describing all of these different systems at play that kind of could be improved, there's probably one that stuck out to you as a listener. There's probably one where you're like, this one I really care about. This one is really interesting to me. It's not necessarily the job of each of us to solve every one of these problems, but I think that we all have the ability to work on tackling one of these issues in our own small ways. And I think if we all do that, we're going to be able to take care of all of those things together and kind of rise together, for lack of a better phrase. And so it is helpful to hear the diverse number of ways that people can get involved in being a part of the solution here. Yeah, well, what, what I was quoting them was sort of a, rattled off each of the uh, pillars. And obviously there's overlap between them. And so one of the things we've done, we've developed a methodology, and we actually use this quite often at the community level, uh, using eight pillars. And you can take any project and you can use it to uh, do an analysis to determine whether you're actually taking a systemic approach to solving the problem. And also just to, turns any development project into a peace project. So I'll give, give you an example. So we trained 800 people in uh, Uganda on positive peace probably four years ago, let's say. Uh, and so and then we did a follow-up session for a number of marketers. And one of the guys was out of one of the uh, Rotary Clubs, uh, Sissy Island Rotary Club from memory, and he was managing a project from the school in a very, very poor uh, school uh, to work on improving the literacy rate. And they'd been at it three years and actually hadn't really got anywhere. And so what he decided to do after learning the framework was to go down and apply it within the school. So a well-functioning government, for example, what they did then, they made sure they involved the uh, local elders uh, uh, in what they were going to do. They also got the school principals involved, uh, 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 low levels of corruption, anything donated to the school was branded uh, so that uh, it was uh, uh, very clear. And then there was an inventory kept, which was checked every couple of months. Uh, so there, there are a couple of different things for different pillars like that. But the two which made a really big difference, and I'm going to come back right at the end of the difference because it was stunning. The two which made the big difference, the first was acceptance of the rights of others. And so a lot of the girls weren't coming to school four days a month because they'd have their periods. So they introduced sanitary pads and a, tip and a separate toilet block for them. And sort of that made a difference, okay, they came, they, they said they all kept coming to school all the time. Uh, the second thing, which you never would have picked unless you'd approached it from this angle, was the yeah, good relationships with neighbours. Who would think that that was an issue for a school? But this school was in a, in a very, very poor place and in a rural area, and so the kids at lunchtime would go out and raid all the neighbouring farms for their fruit trees. In these really poor environments, every apple and orange is uh, considered uh, important. So what they did is they planted some 
trees in the schoolyard and then introduced a porridge feeding program at lunchtime. And, like, this costs cents, a couple, a couple of cents a person, mm. so it's really, really not much. And then what they found from that, the attendance at the school went up over 200%. They found that the grades they were getting within the district went up 40%. And so what happened, and a lot of it came back to the feeding, is because it's really poor. These kids, when they got to lunchtime, hadn't been eating. And then what would happen in the afternoon, the brains just weren't functioning as much as well because they weren't getting the nutrition. So giving them the nutritional content lunchtime just in boosted their capacity through the rest of the day. The attendance rates went right up because people now thought, well, gee, if we send the kids to school, they're going to now get fed. Now, none of these two interventions are anything particularly a, uh, revolutionary, but it shows with a systems approach, you do think of things from many different angles. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to dive into a lot of good news about the current state of peace in the world and the future of peace. All right, we have a new sponsor this week. Sounds Good is sponsored by Happily. Happily is the maker of Datebox. Get everything you need for a fun, romantic date night every month so you can spend time with the one you love the most. It's everything you need for a romantic and fun date night in your home right in a box. So kiss your boring dates goodbye. Happily creates unique, exciting dates you can't get anywhere else. They even include a custom playlist and conversation starters for your date. With easy sign up, flexible plans, and fast shipping directly to you, what more could you ask for? I have been using Datebox for years now. Oh my goodness. I've been getting these boxes for years, and they're so high quality, so fun. And it's just, it's a delight to get them in the mail. Take the pressure off date night and get your first Datebox for 50% off. That's 50% off. Just visit thehappily.co. That's the website URL. And use the code good, 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 all one word. One more time, that's happily.co and get 50% off with the code good, good, good. Sounds Good is sponsored by Libro FM. Libro FM is the company that lets you support a local bookstore every time you download an audiobook. Here's how it works. Libro FM members get one audiobook credit per month for $14.99, and you can use it on any audiobook you want. I like using it on the very expensive ones that are much more than $14.99. You also get 30% off of all other audiobooks. If you don't use your credits, no problem. Keep your unused credits for later. And if you get a book and don't love it, again, no problem. Just return it and get a new one. Lastly, when you buy audiobooks through Libro FM, you help support a local bookstore of your choosing. You keep money within your local economy, create local jobs, and make a difference in your community. As a special offer for Sounds Good listeners, Libro FM is offering two audiobooks for the price of one with your first month of membership with the code GOOD. All you have to do is visit the website Libro.fm, that's L I B R O.fm, and use the promo code GOOD to get started with two audiobooks and to help support the show. All right, Steve. So we've talked about some of the consequences. We've talked about some of the realities. And of course, it's really important that we understand, you know, this is the heartbreak, the pain, the injustices in the world so that we can be a part of solving that problem. But there's also good news to be found in the data that you're finding around global peace. And uh, longtime fans of Good 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 will have known this because we've reported on a lot of your annual reports year over year. I love the data that you're able to find. And I would love to hear from you 
where can we find a little bit of hope in the midst of some of the heartbreak? Where where can we find some good news from your data? Yeah, well, there's a lot of good news out in the world. The problem is the press doesn't print on it a lot of the time other than uh, good, good, good and a few others. <laughs> and so, I, oh, look, I think finding positive news is, is excellent. So if we went through the data we've got, so here, here's one for you. With terrorism, the number of deaths caused by terrorism is down 54% since wow. the year, year 2016. So the last four years we've seen dramatic reductions, and that's mainly because of the demise of the uh, groups like ISIL and, to a lesser extent, Boko Haram. So it's excellent news. Now, we're seeing some rise with far-right terrorism, but it's never going to get to the extent which uh, we saw a, with, let's say, a, a, the Islamic terrorists, I don't think. Anyway, positive peace, which we've been talking about. If we look at it, 65% of the countries in the world have actually improved their positive peace in the last wow. decade. So that's, qu- that's quite amazing. Now, when I describe positive peace, I said it consisted of attitudes, institutions, and structures. So structures are things which are always improving. It's like building on bedrock. Uh, uh, so it's a lot of the time it's, you can see it through the quality of the health system. You can see it through a per capita, a, a average per capita income and things like that. So quite often those structures, they're the kind of things we see increase. And they've been progressing uh, uh, greatly over the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, Institutions uh, uh, generally sort of uh, been improving slightly. Uh, Some of the Western institutions, not so much so. We come back to the US, for example, and we looked at the positive piece there. Now, as I mentioned, it's had the 10th largest fall in the last decade of any country globally. That's the bad news. But the good news is the US still has incredibly high uh, uh, positive peace. Now, one of the things which we've noticed uh, uh, over time, and there are exceptions, that the countries which have got where the positive peace is ranked higher than their actual peace tend to sort of move back towards what the uh, uh, positive peace ranking should say it should be. So in some ways, the good news for the US, if we can get its act together, it does have the potential to radically increase its peace. But it does have to reverse the decline in positive peace. That would be another way of looking at it. So militarisation. So military expenditure over the last decade has actually climbed globally, but not by a lot. But what's a more amazing is that two-thirds of the countries in the, in the world have actually decreased the percentage of GDP spent on the military. So more and more countries are seeing a, 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 the futility of having too much money in wasted in a, a defence. If we went across and, let's say, looked at Africa, for example, if we went back 30 years ago, there were a, uh, wars raging between, between those countries all the time. Uh, Africa now is pretty much fixed on its borders and you get very, very little internation fighting, although there's a lot of the uh, militias active within the borders of a whole range of countries. But in the 25 years I've been going to Africa, oh, probably closer to 30 now, it's I can see massive uh, improvements there. So that's all really good. Uh, so climate change, I honestly think we'll get on top of climate change uh, and maybe I'm too... Uh, 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 enthusiastic on that one, but it's it's something, <laughs> some, something I honestly think will, will, will beat. Now, there are other issues storming, storming down, like what, what I call ecolog- other ecological threats. So that's the use of fr- fresh water on the planet, uh, lack of food, many parts of the world, and in many parts of the world, just uh, rampant increases in population. For example, in Africa, 17 countries will double their population in the next uh, year, 30 years or more than double their population in the next 30 years. So Look, I think there's a lot of positives out there. We've got great advancements in a whole range of different forms of technology, uh, uh, particularly in the life sciences, for example. We're all, uh, providing we stay uh, healthy, uh, we're all going to have a much longer lives than what we've had in the past. I think there's a lot of uh, good news out there. It just doesn't get reported so often. Well, we're happy to get to play a, a part. And thank you so much for playing your part in in 
making sure that that good news is coming from a place of data where we can truly trust this and we can celebrate it. And not only that, but we can create more of it and then measure it. And then the cycle continues. Yeah, we've also got a website called Positive Peace Academy. And so people go to that, they can do a course there on positive peace. It takes a few hours to do. We, we want to sort of try and train a million people up on it. And so that's another way we're trying to get this message across. So people search uh, Positive Peace Academy on the internet, they'll come across it and can uh, yeah, go do the course. They could buy the book, Peace in the Age of Chaos, uh, and to get a much deeper understanding of the just the way systems apply to human societies and just the role of peace historically and particularly in the age we're in and how it can be a platform for transformational change. So if we're looking at the world today, uh, what we find, in, particularly in the West, a number of the institutions, I guess they've got squeaky wheels would be the right way to say it. And so positive peace offers a platform for transformational change and start to reinvigorate a lot of the Western democracies. With it, you'll get higher GDP growth, you'll get people who are more happy, better, more adaptability and resilience for when we get hit with shocks. And so for me, this is really, really important. We need a reset uh, for the way we're running our societies if we really want to pro- progress in the 21st century. That's Steve Kilolei, the founder and executive chairman of the Institute for Economics and Peace. You can dive into stories, graphs, and other resources about peace at visionofhumanity.org and pick up Steve's book, Peace in the Age of Chaos. This podcast was created by Good Good Good. At Good Good Good, we help you feel more hopeful and do more good. You can find more good news and ways to make a difference in our weekly email newsletter, our beautiful print good newspaper, or online at goodgoodgood.co. This episode was created by Kaylee Thompson, Megan Burns, and me, Brandon Harvey. It was edited and sound designed by the team at Sound On Studios. You can find out more about their work at soundonsoundoff.com. Please do us a favor by leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode. And when you find an episode you love, please share it on Instagram so we can repost you. And with that, that is a wrap for this week's episode. Go out and create a bit of systemic change and we'll be back next week with more good news and good action. Sound good?